My name is Jennifer Gray Thompson, and I am the CEO of After the Fire. Welcome to the podcast, How to Disaster, Recover, Rebuild, and Reimagine. In this podcast, we bring you the very best practices, best hearts, and great ideas from other disaster-affected communities. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to the podcast, How to Disaster. In this podcast, we try to help communities figure out how to recover, rebuild, and reimagine. In this podcast, we bring you people who've done really cool, effective things for their community. And today is a very proud day to bring you a person that I've been working with for about two years, whose name is Alma Bowen. Alma founded a, a group called uh, Nuestra Comunidad. It's a nonprofit that serves vulnerable communities, primarily the Latinx and senior communities. She has been one of our major grantees um, over the past two years of her organization. We have um, given her support so that she can go into senior living communities and teach them how to build resiliency into their systems and it re really reduce the anxiety of that very vulnerable population. A big gap that Alma fills though in our community is with the Latinx population. You know, you really need people who are boots on the ground in every disaster. And one of the first rules of disaster is to ask the question, what do you need and how can I help? And if you do that, you'll actually serve the community that's in front of you. That's been a really big problem for the public uh, sector and the nonprofit sector. I think that too often we actually serve the community we feel like serving as opposed to asking the community what they need and then directing our program and our funding streams from there. I really admired the fact that Alma gave up a career of 18 years with the Sonoma County Sheriff's Department as a dispatcher because she knew after the fires of 2017 that there was this huge gap of service in recovery and resiliency for our Latinx population and our seniors. She works really hard. It's definitely a grassroots startup um, nonprofit and we've been very proud to support her. She pivoted easily during COVID because she was already had those relationships on the ground. And as she was learning COVID, she was also learning how to serve. Uh, we were very proud to help her um, and support her in that work. And at the same time, when I need something done right and done in Spanish, I turn to Alma. During uh, COVID when it opened, uh, there was a little bit of a, um, what do I wanna say? A little bit of a lag time in getting things out in Spanish at the same time as English. This is something that should be in every, every single county, city, state, no matter what. If you have a population that speaks a language other than English, it's really important in your emergency services that you provide that information at the exact same time. You can imagine how scary it is to go through a disaster and then double that if you're going through a disaster and you don't speak or read the language that all the information is coming into. We also know from working with the Latinx population and working with Alma that there are ways that are most appropriate to serve the population in front of you. Uh, we learned during 2017 uh, during our wildfires and we learned again during COVID. It's really important that if you wanna serve the uh, Latinx community, one of the things to look at is how to get information to them. It may not be in your traditional way. One thing we learned was fund PSAs on the radio. Um, in our case in Sonoma County, we have people who speak Spanish and don't speak any English. And we have people who speak indigenous languages and don't speak Spanish or English. Uh, KBBF in this case, uh, run by the amazing Alicia Sanchez, serves those communities. And so instead of trying to recreate something for us, we found it better just to make sure that we were funding and supporting the communities the, and organizations that were serving um, those populations. So I asked Alma to come on here today to tell you her fire story and to talk to you about best practices for how to serve vulnerable communities, in particular seniors and Latinx. Thank you. So again, welcome Alma Bowen to How to Disaster. Alma, I would really like you to start today by telling the audience about your fire story. What were you doing the night of October 8th, 2017? You know, that, that night is a, a, a point of reference that there was before the fire and then after the fire. 
And so the night of the Tubbs fire, I actually was at that time, I was a 911 dispatcher. And so I was on a day off, or at least I thought it would be my day off and I got called in. And so interestingly enough, I'd been there um, over 16 years, almost 17 at the time when this happened as a dispatcher. And we had what's called an all hands page. In the 17 years, I had never seen it. We've talked about it, we knew what it meant, but I had never seen it happen. That night, my phone went off with a page from the dispatch center with an all hands page. And I thought, uh oh, somebody up there made a mistake and sent out this page because what that page meant was literally all heck is breaking loose. Anybody that's not currently working needs to come into the center. So I put on my uniform and left the house thinking I'll be back home in a couple hours or, you know, obviously something is happening um, and walked into a night that changed my life forever. So I clocked in at 11 o'clock that night was exactly my clock in time. And I, I worked all through the night and into the next day. And what was happening is that the Tubbs fire had just rolled over the hill um, into Sonoma County, into Santa Rosa area. And at the dispatch center, we were receiving thousands of calls literally from community members uh, trying to figure out what was happening, trying to put their mind around this unbelievable fire that we were witnessing. And in the dispatch uh, setting, it was really confusing because we were getting calls from all over the county. So from what, what we could see, it felt like the entire county was on fire because they would they would jump literally from one area to the next without a connecting point. So it was like this firestorm was happening. And for the first time as a lead um, dispatcher, as a commu communication center training officer, we were, we were navigating an area that we had never trained to navigate. So we didn't have protocols in place. What do we tell people that are calling us that are completely surrounded in fire? What do we tell community members about evacuations? What, like, you know, we all had to, to rely on our best instincts as seasoned dispatchers and respond to, to a circumstance we didn't fully understand. Um, it, it literally was call after call after call. It was, it's what it sounds like when a community is not prepared for a disaster. Um, everything from people just asking a question like, well, is there a fire? I smell smoke to people saying I'm completely surrounded in fire. How do, how do I get out of here? And, and knowing- if I, can, if I may, um, one of the things that I would like the audience to hear is that, um, you know, prior to this fire in 2017, we hadn't seen fire behavior like this. So not only was the county not prepared, but even Cal Fire had not seen behavior like this. And it really ended up changing the entire scope of how they responded to wildfires. And most people did not have alerts on their phones. Um, and so it was, it was definitely an emergency situation, but in a way that was so unprecedented that, um, that we have learned since then, but it was just, I mean, to have to think about the first responders, I hope that everyone also considers that dispatchers were first responders too in unchartered territory when 11 fires broke out and 6,000 units of housing were burned on the first night alone. So I wanna give context for people who don't know what happened here. Go ahead. Uh, absolutely, and, and it speaks to the magnitude of what was happening that night. Um, there wasn't a precedence in how to fight the fire, but at the dispatch level, there wasn't a precedence in how to deal with the calls that were coming in. The fire was literally moving sideways. So one of the, to illustrate how confusing and crazy that night was, the fire was on one side of a four lane freeway. And the next thing you know, we start getting calls on the other side of this four lane freeway from people's houses burning, whose houses were burning down. And as we're dispatching them out, units are coming up and going, that's impossible. The fire was just on the other side of the freeway. Can you check the location? I think you have the location wrong. But in fact, there were fires on the other side of the freeway. That fire had crossed four lanes of freeway and was now burning down an entire neighborhood. It on the took other side. the overpass. Like, how rude yeah. is that? It took the overpass. It Besides did. the ember caps, it took the overpass, which is crazy. But go ahead. Yeah, so we were, you know, again, when you're behind a computer screen and as a dispatcher creates what we call an event or a call, it pops onto all of our maps. So as I'm sitting there in front of my own personal consoles, I see red dots popping up all over everywhere. And literally at any given point, we had what looked like hundreds and hundreds of active fires. And so looking at the screen, it was 
unbelievable. It was hard to wrap our minds around the magnitude it was happening. And then also what you have to keep in mind, like you said, 911 dispatchers are also first responders. So what we're hearing are cries of help, chaos, confusion, but also we are experiencing the, the disaster along with our community because we all live here. And so at one point of the night, and it all blurs because it was so hellacious, the volume, the speed of everything that was moving. And then at the same time, I'm thinking, I left my family, my husband and our two young twins at home. The fire looked like it was moving towards our town too. So you're thinking about your own family, you're thinking about the community. And at one point I'm working and I look over and the dispatcher next to me, my coworker has tears just streaming down his face. And I'm thinking, because it was really stressful. So I was thinking the stress is getting to all of us. And what he had just learned was that his house was burning down in that moment. So as he is working at the dispatch center that night, his house burned down. And that story is not unique to us in the dispatch setting. We had doctors, paramedics, firemen, who as they were working to help the community, their own personal houses, their families were in jeopardy. And so they're serving the community and also taking personal loss at the same time. So it was just a, a crazy night that I will never forget because it completely changed how I looked at my future and what I wanted to do with it. So you go through this really um, terrible experience. And I think it's, I really love the fact that, I don't love the fact that there was trauma inside of the dispatch, but I do think it's so important that people understand that um, first responders often lose too in these situations and they are traumatized and that we have to take care of first responders. Um, and as we take care of our community, it's got to include the entire community, including um, post-traumatic um, stress uh, therapy and uh, at least interventions to help take care of them. So I just, I'm so glad that you mentioned that because often the public turns to the, I'm um, sorry, the public turns to the public sector and they say, you have to fix this. And I'm upset you have to also um, take on all of that. And the people who are taking on all of that are also holding their own trauma their own experience and often their own loss so that is so true so true yeah and so, i think that that a, an important element is that um, this goes on for a long period of time because the first few nights of the fire you know we're in that mode but for the month month and a half two months afterward our dispatch center did not work like the way it normally did and then people started feeling and processing their trauma at different times and so we had as a as a staff as a dispatch center we had to be able to not only continue to serve the community but bounce back and try to make do with with what we had because at a different points people had to take time off because of mental health people had to take time off because they lost their property and at the same time we're still continuing to do our job that we did every day so it was you know layer on layer of uh, of having to learn to cope so talk to us then about how do you turn that fallacious experience into something so useful. I, I gave an intro um, and in the intro, you know, I talked about how you then went on to leave a, a, a career that you really loved um, to start this organization to serve vulnerable communities, in particular the Latinx and senior community. So did you go home and talk to your husband and say, you know, this is what I want to do and take us like, I think the human story is so important in the direction of how to disaster because it's all done by humans, so. It is, and I think at first I didn't really know what was gonna come of it. It's kind of, I always kind of want to look at it as a phoenix rising moment in my life where out of the fire, this beautiful thing arose. And so I felt like um, after what we talked about, the trauma of it afterward didn't really hit me personally uh, until about a month later. And so uh, what had happened the day that it really hit me in full and I started kind of, I felt like I gave birth to this thing, but I didn't know I was in labor yet. And so that first month, I kind of started feeling this thing in my stomach and my gut, you know, this like churning and I was like, okay. But I felt like it was the emotion of everything that was happening. 
um, there was part of a road that was shut down that overpass that you were talking about that they had the nerve to overtake. Well, there was a mobile home park that burnt down right there in that corner. And um, it was called Journeys in Mobile Home Park of all the names, right? Um, but it was a senior mobile home park. And as a dispatch center, we took calls from there all the time for the you know 17 years prior to the fire. I, there was calls there daily. People are older, they have issues. So I had a relationship to that community that I didn't really even know I was I was aware I had seniors vulnerable a lot of health issues. The first time they opened that road, um, prior to that, I'd had to drive to work what I called the long way. I had to go around, and I didn't get to see that area for about a month. When they opened that up, the first night I drove to work and actually drove in front of the park and saw it completely broke burnt down. All these houses, rows and rows of houses, were gone, burnt to the ground. And um, something happened when I saw that park that I barely was able to roll into our dispatch parking lot, which is only a block away. And I completely had a meltdown for the first time since the fire. I had overflowing emotions that I couldn't control. I was crying. I called up to my supervisor and said, I'm in the parking lot, but I need some time. And what hit me was that here was this vulnerable population that for 17 years I felt I had been protecting and helping. And that night there was nothing I can do for them. There weren't even resources that I could send them because every everybody was busy with the fire and other emergencies. And what I realized in that night is that I was not in that chair just to witness this event, but to do something different about it, to make a change, to move the needle, so that that's this particular level of um, unpreparedness and chaos did not happen again for all of our community, especially our vulnerable. And so um, that I believe was the catalyst that night, that realization that I need to take what I learned, what I saw, what I'm feeling right now, this sense of loss, I need to take it and make something good out of it. And so I started thinking of an organization. I started thinking about wanting to do this type of work and I, right away, um, almost instinctually, I wanted to do a nonprofit where I can direct the work in the way I knew it needed to go. Um, and so um, I kind of chewed on it for a few months. And then I finally got brave enough to approach my husband because like you said, I was in this wonderful career almost 20 years in um, that I love doing, serving the community. And so now I wanted this bright idea to stop doing that, that I've been doing and start this new thing, which I wasn't even sure if it was gonna work or how was it gonna go, but this is what I wanted to do. Um, so I approached my husband and surprisingly, he almost already knew it was coming because of the talk and because of what he saw kind of this metamorphosis happen in front of his face. And so when I said, I wanna start a nonprofit, I wanna do disaster preparedness to all communities, especially our, our vulnerable population. I wanna do 911 awareness. I wanna teach the community and give them the tools that they need for not just disasters, but other safety and health events, because this is what I feel like I need to do. I'm guided to that. And so we spent, almost a year forming the nonprofit, at which time we started doing the work, you know, doing the bylaws, forming the board, doing all the things we needed to do. And then um, we received our 501c3 in November of uh, 2018. And in February, on my birthday of 2019, I resigned my position as a dispatcher at that point, almost 20 years in and walked away from that, but only, but to fully embrace the work I was doing through Nuestra Comunidad. And that's where I've been. So with Nuestra Comunidad, can you, um, so tell us how you decided on your pro, you know, your bucket specifically, because there's so, when you say vulnerable, there's so much need in a vulnerable population. But, you know, we were, I like to say we were early adopters of Alma Bowen and your vision because uh, we've been big believers and you see great people with good ideas that you believe that you should invest in and you were an easy decision for us um, because of your passion and your experience. Um, but tell us like, or tell the audience, how did you decide, you know, what particular vulnerable populations, uh, what is the population here in Sonoma County that not that you only work here, but um, primarily you work here that you wanted and what exactly did you want them to know in order to help them stay safer and be more resilient? Um, that's a great question. And so there, 
the, when I saw vulnerable populations, I looked at historically who's most affected in disasters, and that was reflected in our own loss. You know, we lost people during that fire, and historically, it's the older people because they're by themselves, they have mobility problems, um, they're not connected, they don't, you know, they weren't aware of what to do. So the the senior population was was somebody that right away, and especially with my experience with that mobile home park, it brought it home to me that that's where some serious loss happens. And then I thought in the moment of disasters, where did I see the holes? And interestingly enough, one of, one of the biggest holes that was like screaming out at me is that although we did receive calls from Spanish only speakers, proportionately, we were receiving a lot less calls than what we should have received for the impact that it had on that community. And it spoke to the bigger problem that they were afraid to access the 911 system. And so, as much as the people that did access and how can I help them better understand how to prepare and connect and make sure they're getting alerts was like, who isn't accessing and why? And you know, what are the fears, the walls that I can break down so that they're not afraid to use a system that's here to help them. And so the Latinx, um, primarily Spanish speaking community and the seniors were my first two groups that I knew from impact that I saw that night that needed, um, that I wanted to outreach to and make sure I was reaching. But then the community as a whole, because when disaster strikes, it didn't matter from Fountain Grove, which is a more affluent area to Coffee Park, which is, you know, middle to uh, middle to um, middle upper class, the disaster hits everybody the same. But then some of the other holes I saw was in re disaster recovery. Not everybody recovers the same. And so being able to help them prepare, but then look at what can you also do to make sure that you can that you build your resiliency so you can recover from disasters. So part of what we teach along with disaster preparedness is also um, what can you do to make sure you have, you know, maybe some funds put away for a disaster time, renters insurance so that if you lose everything you own during a fire, but you don't actually own your property, but you can get moving and go on with your life. A lot of the people that I that I learned of that after the disaster never recovered and had to actually move out of the area were renters that did not have renters insurance or any kind of savings. So when that disaster hit, they just couldn't lift themselves out of that. And, and so, most of them though, they don't, unless you, you know, people go on with their lives and we're normal. So we, we, we hope for the best. We don't always prepare for the worst, but renter's insurance can be as little as like $10 a month and you can do it on your phone. Yes. You know, and I just have to put that plug in there that if you are a renter and you are hearing this or you have friends that are renters, you've got to tell them to get renter's insurance because it is the difference. And also videotape your home. Yes. You know, um, you can do it in pictures, that's fine. But if you walk around for 10 minutes and just videotape your home at the beginning of each fire season, you'll be so much happier at the end if, if should you lose your home. But I just want to plug that, keep going, keep on rolling. You're doing great. No, and that's true. You know, it's even the simple things. And that was another thing that's so striking is that disaster preparedness is not particularly laboring and extensive or difficult, but yet so many people, even now I still get shocked. Three years into doing this work, I'm out in community, even during COVID, I remained out in community as much as I could doing outreach around COVID, but also continuing disaster preparedness, awareness and outreach. And people, you know, we're four fires in Sonoma County and some people are still not prepared. They don't have their communication plan. They don't have a disaster plan. They don't have an evacuation plan. They don't have their go bag. They don't have their stay home box. Like all the essential elements, they still don't have it. So how do we encourage and motivate or even help um, get community members from point A knowing that they need to do this to point B and actually doing it? And I believe that takes continued engagement in that build, you know, building relationships. And also um, the bigger picture, one of our, our hashtags is um, um, disaster resilience minded. That's one of them. And also a culture of preparedness. So I believe that becoming prepared, being prepared, is going to be a cultural shift that needs to happen. And so I do a lot of work at schools, everything from kindergarten up to high school, different levels of disaster and 911 awareness. But I think if we start getting it in when they're children, I want to build a culture of preparedness where conversations around preparedness, actually preparing 
um, taking the steps necessary is just part of what we do. And so we don't think of, think of it as this weird thing on the side. We think of it as just something we do. We're not talking bunkers. I mean, if you want to bunker it out, we're not stopping you. I don't think it's really going to help you in a wildfire. So I think that there was almost like a um, a, a stigma attached to being prepared that somehow then we're all hoarding guns too. And we're not talking about that. Um, it's actually not even true that in the midst of a disaster that people pick up guns and start shooting each other and hoarding their food. It's actually, they start sharing their food, they put down their guns and they, they help each other out. I mean, COVID was a bit of a misnomer, but the rest of it um, is true. I, I that when you were talking about schools, I just remembered sitting with you, you with you in my office a couple of years ago, and you and you talking about how you also wanted kids to go home to their families and say, "Hey, what's our what's our disaster plan? How are we prepared?" So, can you talk about that a little bit? Because there's there's that there's that double bonus there, of changing the culture, but also using you know kids as a pathway in a good way for um, better safety preparedness with their parents. Absolutely, and I even would sweeten the pot a little bit and it doesn't take much with kids. I would get water bottles or you know an item. And so when I would do a presentation in a class, I would give them a, a, a draft of a disaster plan. And I would say the first 10 kids that bring this back to your teacher, I'm leaving these with her or him. And then the first 10 students that come back with a copy of their plan will go home and talk to your parents and tell them you need to sit down and make a plan. And then you're gonna get a water bottle or I would get like a cool lunch box that they could use for their little kit things like that. And so I had teachers involved in it and the smallest thing, you know, a, a little uh, a water bottle, a, a, a radio, anything that they feel is a prize or acknowledgement. And then we'd always have a commitment certificate. I would say I would have them sign a little pledge that they were going to become preparedness ambassadors to their families. And I would put a sticker on it. That oh, I like that. It. Put, a, put a pin in that. Yeah. preparedness ambassadors like they loved it perfect and, yeah and they loved it because it's like oh i'm going to do that you know and then i would say and if you're my preparedness ambassador then you're going to get a prize plus we're going to put your certificate up on the wall just little things like that and so teachers would say like their kids would totally do it and so that's all it took it's it's making them a part of it making them uh, an ambassador giving them a role giving them a responsibility you go home and you teach your family they loved it and we're talking kids as small as kindergarten they're totally um able to reach into their own family and talk to them. And if you have a language barrier, normally that, you know, like primarily Spanish speaking only parents, that children are, and I know this from grow, from my own lived experience, when we were in school, we were the ones that brought all the information home to our parents because they're, my parents to this day only speak Spanish. And so we actually were the ones bringing the information home. And so it works for any, whether you're a Spanish speaker or not, but in those situations, those parents are actually relying on the students to bring home the information. And so all the kids became really active in it. And I could see the growth just in the years, COVID totally put a kibosh on my school outreach. But in the years I did it, from kindergarten to first or second grade, after a while, the kids can start telling you the elements of preparedness, or they'd see me and they're like, oh, it's the it's the emergency lady or the 911 lady or, you know, but so they started relating who I was into what we were going to talk about. And so um, I love it, was, that. it was exciting developing curriculums that were age appropriate, but then also, you know, we were trying to uh, crack, uh, crack the net of how do we engage junior high and high school students because they're a totally different beast than you know elementary school. And so we're, uh, we're bringing on a resilience um, leadership uh, component where we're gonna engage with high schools with their juniors and seniors uh, around preparedness, around resilience work, but also connect them to EMS so that they find out about careers in EMS. So fire, oh. police, EMTs, like you know, right now it's a program that we're looking to fund, it's brand new, but that's gonna be a really good way to engage with college, with high school age students, because they don't want to hear just that somebody come in and talk to them. They want to be involved and they want to see how can it relate to them. And um, you know, everybody likes everybody likes to be somebody in front of somebody else. 
Exactly. So, yeah. so um, I love that. And I love that you're going to go into junior high and high schools because um, certainly, you know, they too can be ambassadors and, and very engaged in it. I think one of the reasons why we've always really liked what you do is we felt like you really meet people where they're at. And so much about disaster work has to be to say, um, what do you need and how can I help? And then you decide what your programs will look like. We think a lot of philanthropy is a little bit broken in that sense. And instead it's like, here's what I think you need. And so here's what I'm going to fund. And so create it from there. And we liked your approach to going into, um, you know, the, the, the biculturalism is incredibly important. Um, the Spanish speaking is incredibly important, really pushing to make sure that all public entities release information in Spanish and English at the same time, that that's a priority and in ways that can actually be delivered, um, in, you know, because it's not always the same. And so if you could just talk to us about first your approach with the Latinx community um, the, and, and, you know, and also understanding the Latinx community isn't just like one block with one answer, you know, that's just not the case. There's tons of diversity there, but how did you decide your programming um, and what's really important for people to know who may not know anything about that community and they're trying to figure out how to serve um, a, a community that is not, you know, that is bicultural and bilingual. We'll start there and then we're going to go to seniors. Absolutely. And I think it's a feed, having a feedback loop. You have to have the ability. And, and um, one of our philosophies is uh, what we call a push and a pull. So there's always information that you're trying or training you're trying to push out into the community. But just as if not more important, it's what you're pulling back the information you're pulling from that community. And so even though I myself am a, a Latina, um, you know, that came here to the United States as a very small child, I recognized early on that my experience was different. You know, even though I had a lot of commonality to the, and we're talking specifically to servicing the Latinx community. So Latinx doesn't just mean you only speak Spanish or English. Uh, you, there is a gamut of indigenous languages that I myself don't speak. So even for me, that's been an, uh, a nut that I'm trying to still actively not only understand, but respect. You cannot approach a community without acknowledging who they are, respecting in full who they are, their autonomy. Um, and if you can't approach it that way, it's gonna come off in, in genuine and they're gonna read it right away and that, that disengages people right off the bat. So coming in with that humility and being humble enough to say, look, I don't fully understand how to approach your culture. Can you please help me understand? And what is it that you need and how can I meet that need? You know, you asking, I, I was surprised early on how off I was, even with what I had as understanding, some of the times how off I could be in what I thought people needed and missed, you know, bl was blind um, uh, as to what some of the needs are. An example of that is I started doing, when COVID hit, I started doing these tailgate trainings, talking to vineyard and field workers about COVID safety because that we had a huge outbreak in our Latinx community, a lot of which were our farm and vineyard workers, and we were trying to help with that. And so one of my first trainings, I was giving them all the information. And then at the end, I always ask for feedback. So this is, again, that feedback loop and that, you know, I'm taking away with you as much as what you bring. And I said, can you, you know, can somebody share with me what are the obstacles for you to stay safe from COVID? And this young gentleman raised his hand and said, I don't have enough cloth masks. They give me this disposable mask at work, but when I go home, I don't wear it. I've been wearing it all day at work and it's dirty and I don't have money to go get masks. So I need cloth masks I can rewash and wear. Here I am giving this presentation with materials and stuff and I don't have masks to give them. So I had obviously missed the ball on that. So after that, I left, went and got some masks, came back to that crew, gave the masks. And then from then on, every time I did COVID outreach or training, I made sure I had PPEs with me, masks, sanitizers, everything that, I, that somebody would need to stay safe and acknowledge that maybe access to these things were actually a bigger problem than information. They understood it, but they didn't have access. And so but you also, I remember talking to you about this, um, you know, while this was going on and you said that you learned something really important too, that 
um, they weren't putting the masks on until they got to work, but they, you know, it's very common for uh, farm, farm workers to carpool. It's more yes. common than not. And so they were, they were picking each other up and then riding to work and, um, and then putting their masks on. Meanwhile, they'd been in close contact for that entire period. So, and that and they were able to figure that out um, through your feedback loop and address that concern. So I want to give you props. I don't want to miss that prop because I, <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, for me too. No, and it was. And if you think about it, there would be, you know, at any given point, four to six men or women in a vehicle from four to six households now all sharing the space and then going back and sharing with their family when they went home. And so, hello, you know, talk about a fast rate of spread. You know, you're going to, that, that was a big contributor too. And there was no intention. They weren't like, oh, we don't care. It wasn't that at all. It was just that sometimes you just need somebody to be like, hey, you need to put, you know, it would actually help if you put it on when you, you know, before you got in the vehicle, because people are just trying to live and survive. And, and so just that, but that's an example where I, once again, saw you meet the community exactly, you know, where they're at and not tell them what they should need, but you heard it, you listened, and then you pivoted and met the moment. So I love that. Can you talk to us about, um, Oh, one thing before I, before we move to seniors, because I think seniors are just, so important, especially in disasters. Um, but with the um, Latinx community, there's always an issue of sheltering during a disaster, never worse than during COVID. But let's take COVID out of the equation for long-term disaster, for how-to disaster. And let's say that we won't have this horrible pandemic forever. Um, and, you know, what we found was that a lot of um, the undocumented Latino popul Latinx population, Latinx population wouldn't go to our shelters um, because they actually thought, well, um, ICE will be there. And they weren't wrong in 2017 because the head of ICE got on national television and said that an undocumented person started our massive wildfires, which was completely not true. And our sheriff had to actually respond to that. And he did. Um, sheriff Giordano did a be beautiful job basically saying that's a complete lie. Um, however, it's, 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 it's an ongoing issue. And recently I had um, Nancy Brown on from the county of Sonoma talking about um, the signage that they created for all the shelters. And one of the things that we talked about um, was well, that's great, but how are they, then they have to get all the way to the shelter before they would know that immigration won't be there. So they've already made that decision. So if you're meeting them where they're at, then you probably need to figure out a way for them to have that information in advance and what's, and you know, that sort of thing. So can you talk about the special needs of the undocumented um, population? Absolutely. And one of the things that, that I think is often missed is that in a lot of households, we have mixed documentation too. So we have missed, missed, uh, mixed statuses. So the majority of the family could be have some type of legal status, but they have the one relative or the one person or just somebody in that household that does that is not. And that actually puts that whole family in that stance because they're afraid for their loved one. And so that whole family would make the whole choice, even if most of them didn't feel threatened by ICE or not. And so I think understanding that most households have some level of mixed status when it comes to immigration is important because that, that is actually more accurate. Um, but also I think that making, at least for NC, part of what we talk about during disaster prep in general, when I'm talking to a Latinx uh, community, uh, knowing your audience and, and making sure that I'm addressing that fear ahead of time. Uh, and telling them that in California, it's illegal for ICE to come in and do their ICE duties and a shelter. Now, although there is no guarantee ever, um, because we cannot guarantee that it would never happen, uh, but we do advocate for like, during that time, that's still the safest place for you to be at. But also on the other um, side of it, what we have to recognize and plan for is that normally places that are not designated our shelters, but our, our um, places that the Latinx community feels comfortable at, this is where they're gonna show up to disaster, during disasters, whether it's a designated shelter or not. So how about we make sure that those places are ready to receive the population and work with them and maybe having those 
even if they're unofficial, well-equipped, well-trained shelters that people can feel comfortable going to and that we can receive them in the way they need to be received. So that's and if I, can, I want to give an example of how this went horribly wrong in Sonoma Valley and um, both horribly right and horribly wrong because we obviously hadn't we were surrounded by fires so we had to create our own food systems and um the two there were three shelters downtown Sonoma um and two of them were occupied occupied by very physically um compromised and um, um, disabled people from Sonoma Developmental Center and the staff mm -hmm. And then the third one was a general one, but there was nothing in the Springs where I live, nothing. There was, and in fact, there was like official people other than police and fire wouldn't even go out there except for Congressman Mike Thompson. So I'm always going to give him that prop. Um, it, we were left very much on our own. And, you know, there are 15,000 people and over 50% of them are, um, are Latinx. So, and about 27% are um, undocumented. And that means that many of them live in mixed status households. But what we found is many of them are sheltered in place. So we had to figure out a trusted, um, a, a trusted um, organization. So churches are good. Um, I'm on the board of La Luz and La Luz is a resource center. And so they could push out information and they opened up like essentially a care station where they could feed and um, provide uh, diapers. Diapers are always a good idea. Don't send your old clothes, send diapers. I'd like to note that. Um, and, but then at the same time, there was another school in our district called El Verano Fa uh, Community School. And Maite Aturi, who's this, one of my favorite people on the planet, um, she's a trusted leader. She has a family resource center. So she, she, we helped her and she opened a care center where people could come get what they needed. And the school district shut it down after about three days because they didn't want to deal with it. And it was infuriating because it, they had this opportunity. There was a commercial kitchen there. They could have easily served a large portion of vulnerable population. And there was, it was just, no, I don't want to deal with it. And it was incredibly disappointing and it was a missed opportunity. And now we have three schools in the Springs that are certified. You can get your school certified by the Red Cross and the counties in advance because you cannot expect people to go to places, especially in a place like downtown Sonoma, that's uh, mostly white and well-resourced and wealthy, and it's where people go to work, and it's not where people go for comfort. And I just want to, you know, maybe some people won't like it that I'm being so frank about that, but get certified now. Um, for your trusted um, low and churches, churches, resource centers, schools, has to be said. No, it does, and I think it's really important. And I think that there's a there's a point where we can work together on this. So, an example during the Kincaid fire, the Hillsburg Community Center was the first evacuation center, and so Corazon Hillsburg, who's an organization that does a lot of work with the Latinx community in that area, um, is already housed there, and they have daycares there, so they were already on site. So when Red Cross came in. Um, I got pulled in as a partner of Corazon, and we actually had a presence there and worked alongside with the Red Cross to provide, when they walked in the door, there was the, a, a whole table of, of, um, of Spanish-speaking volunteers to welcome. 90, 95% of the people that showed up at that center were Spanish-only speakers. And so being able to welcome them give, with a trusted face that they knew made all the difference where people were coming in and staying, you know. And, and that then was they, what we learned in one, but mind you, we learned that between 2000, October of 2017 and October of 2019. So that was progress. And so you don't have to be perfect, but you do have to aim for progress. Absolutely. And so now, you know, one of the things is that, is how do we get more, like you said, churches, resource centers, schools, designated as you know partners in sheltering people during disasters because that's where people are going to go that are not feeling comfortable in the regular you can tell people and i do make it part of of my training and my outreach to let them know hey you're safer there than anywhere you know because we have had circumstances where people aren't safe feeling safe so then they they go off somewhere and then they don't have food they don't have resource they don't have shelter they're you know we don't even know where they're at so they could be at risk and we don't even know so that's not safe either you know 
And so it, it's it's still a lot of progress, but I think, like you said, we're making progress and we have to continue to move in that direction. We do. So I'd like to turn now to the special needs of seniors. Um, you know, seniors are, are the possibly the most vulnerable besides the disabled in a disaster. They are the least likely to rebuild after a disaster. There are all kinds of issues. We tend to have our wildfires coincide with a massive power shutoffs for obvious reasons. Um, during the 2017 fires, we didn't have uh, power for 10 days and other places didn't have power sometimes for up to three weeks. Um, and then during Kincaid, we actually had a cold snap um, in addition to a six day PS of a public safety power shut off. So this is not an unusual co you know, morbidity, if you want to call it that. Um, seniors often have medication that has to be um, refrigerated. And, um, and you know, it's little things too. Unfortunately, in 2017, we had seniors um, who died in their homes and often in their garages. So California passed a law that uh, Cheryl, my friend Cheryl Dean uh, made sure it happened through uh, Senator, State Senator Bill Dodd's office that said that uh, anytime you um, buy a new home, it has to have a battery backup. But most homes, we don't, we don't build that many homes um, except during disaster, which means that for most of us, um, can you get out of your garage with your car? Um, in, if you are a senior in particular for anybody, you know, pull your car out of the garage if you're in the middle of a red flag warning, if you are concerned at all, face it towards the road. Um, and with seniors, this is just, you know, if your neighbors check on them and, you know, so I wanted you to go into your wonderful work with, um, in, I love your stories about working with uh, senior communities, but I did want to make a plug for really do not leave your car in the garage during a red flag warning because, you know, my, it, you know, maybe one of you can open up the garage without power, but maybe the other one can't. And what if one, you know, very important, especially if you're a senior or you are disabled in any way. So can you talk about your work with senior communities? Because it's so awesome. It is, you know, it's part of uh, uh, that jewel, you know, in your cap, the the highlight. And, um, and it's interestingly enough, one of the best projects I've worked with you guys, you know, you guys funded me to do some work uh, around uh, a low income senior facility in Santa Rosa. So they called one of the tenants called and said, we're a low income senior facility, but we're on our own like you know we just we get low income apartments, but nobody's here helping us, and she was afraid because what's happening is a lot of seniors are very isolated. Uh, many of them their families don't live in this area so they don't have people checking on them they don't have people helping them prepare their kids or even knowing what to do and then there the digital divide that we see is an issue with some of our latinx community is also an issue with our senior community most of them you know if they have a cell phone only use it to make calls many of them don't even text on it um, they're learning more and some of them are more adept but in general uh, i found they were very limited in their access to technology and so so this woman named Sue called and said, we're afraid a lot of us um, survived, obviously, the Tubbs fire, but some of us were displaced at that time and ended up here. Nobody's helping us. We want information. So um, I went in and did a series of disaster preparedness presentations with disaster plans. And what started happening was pretty pretty cool. So I did a presentation. The first group of about 15 seniors showed up for the first one. And I had a series of six scheduled out the next series, the next time I did it, it was going to be the six same series six times to make sure everybody had a time slot they can attend the second one, everybody that came for the first one came back again, even though they'd already covered the information. And then we had maybe another 15 new people. So then we had 30. The next one, the room was full. The next one, it was, you know, people kept coming back. But then beyond that, what happened is that they all did their plans. We talked about communications. I helped them sign up to alerts and understand alerting. We talked about people that had medications that needed to be uh, refrigerated, things that we can do. How do we work our way around that for PS when our powers are shut off for the PSPSs? But then what happened is that I had a core group of about 12 to 15 seniors. This is 70 year old plus seniors that wanted to form their own version of disaster preparedness, uh, like their version of COPE, which is citizens organized to prepare for emergencies, but they called it ROPE, 
residents organized to prepare for emergency. So every week I would meet with them. They had a board, they had a committee, they formed this all themselves, I just facilitated. Um, we had a list of priorities of, of things we're gonna co uh, cover from uh, how to use a fire extinguisher. So I was pulling in the fire department to come in and help me train. But these people, these ladies and a couple of gentlemen, all 70 plus became so driven in not only keeping themselves safe, but their neighbor safe and making sure that everybody would be able to get out of that building. And we were addressing like, if there is an emergency, because a lot of them don't drive. So they were like, how are we gonna get out of here? They're not providing a public transportation. So we were looking at what are you gonna do? But it was incredible to see. And to me, it speaks to that whole culture of preparedness within this little community that was one time scared, uh, anxious, anxiety written, became this empowered community that had a plan, were working together on helping each other. Now that is like fantastic. That's the dream right there is to have communities within themselves that can help one another. Because during disasters, the first 72 hours, that's who you're gonna rely on. If you cannot get out of your area, your neighbors, your friends, those are the people that are actually gonna help you. And so to see this in this older community and to see their confidence level go from point A to point B was amazing. So COVID kind of put a stop to the meetings, but now that things are getting opened up a little bit, we're starting to talk about reinstating the meetings and having them continue with their list of priorities. But that was a perfect example. Um, and seniors, oftentimes their, their adult children don't live in the area. Some of them don't have adult children. They're all on fixed incomes. Um, a lot of them don't understand the new language, the new developments. And so they feel really lost. And, well, and I would like to make a I would like to make a, a point of saying that um, I'm always um, a little bit amazed at how hard programs like yours are to fund publicly. Like you're not asking to become a multimillionaire off of New Esther Communidad, mm -hmm. but you are asking just you know, or I'm going to ask for you, even though you're not saying it, to say you know it would be nice if I knew where my next three to five years of funding was coming from and if I could hire within the community to actually multiply my effects so that I knew, so that we knew that every um, every senior community, low income or not, but in particular low income, was actually prepared and there was some kind of plan. It seems to me that you should always be fully funded in that way. You are doing um, a service that is critical and um, builds confidence and resiliency, like one you know micro community at a time. So you may not say it, but I'm going to say it. You can, you know, you can follow a link to donate to Alma. <laughs> no, thank you. And that's often the the hard part. You know, that's the rub. It's like right now with Nuestra Comunidad, we're really looking at building capacity because this momentum of disaster work is not stopping. If anything, it's increasing. And so there's a thousand of those communities that, that need that. And like you said, whether they're low income or not, that community happened to have reached out to me because there was such a level of anxiety that they were talking amongst themselves. And they saw me out because they heard about the work I was doing, but there's a thousand communities like that that need that level of involvement to get them on the right track to help build a system that they can function in to become more resilient themselves. Because that's ultimately the goal. I can't be everywhere. The fire department can't be everywhere. Police department cannot be everywhere. During a disaster, guess what? You're on your own. And that is a reality that I learned in 2017 that was the hardest spill, pill for me as a responder to swallow. And that's the stuff that keeps us awake at night as responders. Sure. And it's also shocking until you go through a disaster, how many gaps of opportunity exist. And it's not that people don't care. It's just that, um, you know, you don't, you don't fund what you haven't seen yet. You know, you don't prioritize something that hasn't happened yet. And there isn't, if there's no history or memory attached to it, then it can be very difficult to be like, well, this is something we should do, but we are entering you know, an era of um, pretty major disasters. Last year was the worst disaster year on record for FEMA. There were $21 billion or over disasters just in 2020. And um, they counted all of our wildfires across the Western United States as one of those 20. And those were at $16.5 billion in damage and over 10 million acres were burned. 
I just was on a conference this morning and 2020, uh, 2021 is um, forecast to be um, perhaps even worse. And we are not people, we are not alarmists. In fact, uh, we are people who stay pretty mellow in the face of disaster because we know that we have to be the leaders, but um, we want to encourage everyone to, you know, develop leadership in that area and resiliency in that area and to, you know, if you can help to fund it, if you can, um, you know, in some way participate or at least make sure that you don't have to call um, 911 or don't think FEMA is going to come in and save you because they are really like they need you to be on your own for about 72 hours and even then it's a very slow process. So I, I love the work that you do and I, I know that it's time for us to um, to wrap up but I'm hoping that you can leave us with some final thoughts on, you know, if somebody's sitting like in, in, you know, Nevada and they're thinking, oh, about wildfire or another type of disaster, or I, you know, Idaho, for example, there are thousands of vulnerable communities and they're thinking, what can I, what small step can I take to help my community be more resilient? Can you talk about that? Yes, I always tell because oftentimes they people when they hear this story, they ask like, well, what can I do right now? It's often hard to put yourself in a disaster mode when you're not in it. But I would say make the partnerships now connect, you know, think about if you're a government organization or um, if you're with the disaster office in your area and you're involved in disaster response before a disaster hits, think of the of the connections, the community partners that you have to already have maybe a contract and understanding with beforehand so that when that disaster hits, those things are already placed in place and you're not trying to reinvent the wheel in the middle of the disaster that that's been thought through. Everybody understands the role because the community is the one that gets the better product in that situation. The community benefits from you understanding that you can't do it. So let me reach out, figure out who can and make sure that they're on board and that they are partners in this and that we all have a plan on how we're going to respond for the community. And that you're ready to put out, um, if you have a significant population that is non-English speaking, ensure that you have translators already on contract, uh, yes. that you are ready to push out the information at the same time, not two days later, not a week later, not an hour later. But you know, if you want people to feel prioritized, you actually have to prioritize them. And you know, don't miss your opportunities with seniors because I, I, you know, Alma, I've heard that story now probably six times, and I absolutely never tire of it because I just love it. No, it's it's my favorite. You know, it's when I look back at the work I've done this far, um, that's one of the projects that just makes me feel like I'm in the right space doing the right work. And um, to speak to that, making sure you're responding to the language component. Don't ever also assume that if you have a bilingual employee that that employee can actually translate, please. Like, please hire a trained translator and have them already. This is one of the contracts I'm talking about that you wanna get in place beforehand. That employee should not be tasked with duties like that, that they're not trained to do. And then again, the community is the one that suffers. You put out information that is not correctly translated. It could cause a, a bigger issue already. And then making sure that you're going to trained interpreters. There's an entire code of ethics behind interpreting. I was a medical interpreter also, and I had to, most of what I learned in, in that training was actually the code of ethics that comes with that. And if you're missing that, you're opening yourself to liability and also you're doing a disservice to the community that you're serving. Well, you know, Alma, um, I've always been a big Alma fan and nothing about today has changed that. And I hope that this podcast creates even more fans. And um, I really uh, appreciate you as my colleague and my friend and, and also someone that I know that I can um, always uh, reach out to and lean on in times that are um, have disaster or not. So thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you for having me here. And also thank you for being one of the very first people in this county that believed in what we were doing and, and put your money where your mouth was, to be honest. You know, when we came into it, it's, it's the partnerships, like your partnership was critical in getting us on our feet. So thank you. Uh, my pleasure. Are you kidding? We're, we were fortunate to do it. So thank you. And this has been another episode of How to Disaster. Thank you for spending time with us. Thank you for joining us on the podcast, How to Disaster. For more information, please visit our website at afterthefireusa.org. And if you liked this video, please hit subscribe.